All right, so welcome everyone, also to people on Moodle, welcome, welcome. Um, we are just going to start. So today we will have a lecture about standards for analysis. Um, so there's a lot of like kind of standard things in bioinformatics. Um, so I just wanted to run through a couple of these things. Um, so um, of course, again, please register for the exam if you haven't already. Um, pretty important. I haven't gotten the feedback from anyone yet that they were unable to register. Um, so I guess everything's going well there and I hope that everyone can find it in Agnes um, and can register. So um, if you have any problems registering uh, then send me an email and I can contact the Prüfungsbüro. And um, of course if you don't register, I think it's two or three weeks before the date, um, then you are unable to participate. So if you're planning on getting a grade for the course, then do register. Alright, so the overview for today, um, first we want to talk about, or first I wanted to talk about different types of files and some formats which are commonly used in bioinformatics like uh, comma separated files, FASTA files, FASTQ files, GFF, VCF and PET files. Um, there's a lot of different other formats like SOM and BOM and these kinds of things, but they are generally very complex. Um, someone asked me to add PDB to it um, and I wrote a PDB parser like a couple of, well not a couple of years, but I think around a year ago or something and um, the format is described in like a 160 page document. Um, so I thought that that was a little bit overkill. So I don't think that it makes sense to kind of discuss that. So after we've discussed all kinds of different file types and stuff, of course we will um, talk about some coding things um, because also there, um, there are some standards. Um, so I wanted to talk about the difference between things like unit tests, regression tests, um, integration tests and these kinds of things. Um, and then I want to say a couple of words about test driven development um, and agile development. It doesn't play a big role in academia, um, but sometimes it's good to know what's out there and how you can kind of structure your, well, programming work in a, in a more structured way. I wanted to talk a little bit about documentation, so code documentation mostly, and the different types of code documentation which are out there. And then I added a part which I stole from the R lecture, or stole, well it's not stealing if you made the original one, right? So um, I kind of auto plagiarized it from myself, um, and that is about R packages. So I'm going to teach you guys how to um, make an R package um, and hopefully we will be able to do that after the first break, second break. Um, but of course, like always, before we start, um, let's have a look at the assignments. I hope everyone did the assignments. I'm not so sure everyone did. Uh, because I didn't get any questions. I, I did get someone emailing me, but not about the assignments. Uh, that was about um, wanting to have the time travel paper from Kerry Moodis, um, which is a really nice paper to read. So um, if you're interested, just send me an email. Um, and I also had someone who wanted to know about one of the um, papers written from freely available geo data sets, so I also send that. Um, so um, I might actually upload the Kerry Muller's paper to Moodle and make it obligatory. I was very busy this week and I will do it this week. Yeah, that's what I say as well when I don't want to do stuff. <laughs> right? That's <laughs> We could actually do a prediction about that. Did Commando do the assignments this week, yes or no? And then, uh, but uh, we're not going to do that. But no, um, yeah, it's, it is important to do them. Um, it's the only way you can learn uh, programming. Um, and since, like, uh, like last week, the lecture had a lot of programming, of course, if you want to learn how to program, you just have to sit down and get stuck, bash your head against the wall, Google for half an hour. And then if you can't still figure it out, then just send me an email. Um, but um, at least like I, I will just go through the answers and I will also put the answers online. Um, and I was a little bit 
um, lax. I think I only uploaded the assignments on Monday or Tuesday. Um, so it's also a little bit my fault. Like I should, so if I don't upload the videos and the other stuff to Moodle um, tomorrow, so before Friday 5, then do send me an email to remind me. Um, because if I forget, then it, it, it just has to pop into my mind again. And usually it pops into my mind when I start preparing the next stream. Um, so that's, that's generally Tuesdays or Mondays. Alrighty then, so the assignments from last week were about gene expression analysis. Um, so I will show you guys my Notepad++ window. This is of course not, this is the engine. Um, so again, hey, when you do some coding and when you are coding, um, always make sure that you add a little header, right? So just say in one line, what is the content of this file? Um, who made it? Um, hey, you could add a copyright statement or when it was created, um, but hey, at least have something on top of your file um, so that people can see who did it, who they should contact with questions and what is in the file. All right, so um, the first thing that I did was load the preprocess core library. It only comes up in like question number oh, five or six or something, um, but uh, the the thing is, is that when you write code, then um, the way that I always structure it is first do loading of all external libraries, um, then setting my working directory. And the reason why I do this is because then you can directly at the top of the script see uh, which libraries are required. Right, so if you would put it like all the way when it is needed, which is probably somewhere around here, um, hey, if you would do something like this, then it's kind of hidden. So you don't want to hide things if you, you want people that use your script to know what they should install beforehand. Um, so where did I store the data? Well, the data is stored in my case in, in this folder, like D drive project, lecture, blah. Um, but of course on your hard drive, that will be different. Um, and then there were three files that you should load in. Um, I think the first couple of questions could be done without loading the probe annotation matrix, um, but hey, you need at least the array data and the arrays. So again, hey, R provides this really useful read table function. Um, of course, you have to look into the file, right? So you take the array data.txt um, and you have to open it in Notepad++. Let me actually do that for you guys. Um, so you can see how the file looks like. Um, so I just open up the array data. Um, so what I generally do is when I open up the file and I always use Notepad++ or an editor which allows me to view kind of these kinds of symbols, right? You see these little arrows here? Um, that means that they're tab characters. Um, so if you would have spaces, then those would be little yellow dots um, and the tabs are these little arrows so it's directly obvious that this is a tab separated file and so of course here we have to specify that the separator used in this file is a tab um, there is a header right so if I look at array data then I see here that there's kind of a, a, a header description which looks different from the other lines right so the other lines they have like numbers in them or sequences um, but here you you don't have that one of the things that you can see here is that the first column header is called sequence and then when you look a little bit further down you see that sequence is actually the second um, element right so it's not the first element so that means that there are row names in here so you have to specify row names is one right because every row has a name and the name doesn't have a column header um, so in this case setting row names to one um, had the same thing holds for the arrays um, and here I added this call classes is character I don't know exactly why I did that let me see oh yeah because I don't want um, these numbers to become numbers because they are animal identifiers that we use right it's an individual ID um, so had the, the problem here is if I would say that um, load it in and convert it to the best possible type um, then the last column would be converted to either integers or factors um, and I don't want to do that I, I don't want to use factors in this case so I'm going to specify call classes um, and hit that allows you to specify for each column what the class is but I'm just going to say character which means that it forces all of the columns to be of the character type 
and then I'm loading the annotation matrix. Same thing, just open it up, um, view into the file, see that there's a header, um, so set header to true and the separator is a tab. Um, so let's go to R and load it in and make our first um, box plot. Um, and this already I think is kind of a little trick, um, but first let's go to R and let's show you guys how these different data files look. Um, so we're just going to read them in. The array data takes a little bit of time and you can then use the head function um, to show like the first couple of lines, right? So we see here that indeed it has kind of loaded it in correctly and we can see that there's like a bright corner. Oh, let me see. That's annoying. So uh, let's switch to R. So you can see that it, it when, I, when I look at the head of the array data, I can see that it's more or less fine, right? It has row names because these things are repeated for each of the rows that I have. Um, if they would not have been repeated, then had, there would be another column and then it would have been named sequence, but that's that's incorrect. Um, and then here you see that there's a bright corner and a dark corner, so those are the positive and the negative control of a microarray. And so the bright corner is always on and gives you kind of the maximum intensity value for each of the samples that you had. Um, and then the dark corner is the minimum intensity value of the microarray. So these are just built in positive and negative probes, um, which are either always on or always off. Um, and so you get an idea of what the range, the dynamic range of the, uh, of the microarray is. All right, so let's look at the arrays and yeah, just show a little bit. So this is just the description of the array. So it has the original file name. Um, this is just the file that we got from the company. Um, so you can see that it's done in September 2009 and, and these kinds of things. Um, we have something called comp ID and this is the ID uh, that the company assigned to our sample. We have the strain, so the strain here is either the Berlin Fat Mouse or an F1, which is a cross between the B6 and the Berlin Fat Mouse. And if we want to know how many strains there are, we can just say, well, show me the strain column, um, and then it will show you all of them. So we see that there's also B6 ends in there. Uh, then we have two types of tissue. So we have HT, which stands for hypothalamus, and we have GF, which stands for gonadal fat. And then, of course, we have different individuals, which are marked by the individual ID from the mouse house. So that's kind of how this file looks like. And then we had the annotation matrix. So let's show you a little bit of the annotation matrix. Um, so the nice thing about R is that you can just type in like a couple of letters and then press the top key, um, and it will automatically like fill in the um, um. Meravigliata. Thank you for following me. Thank you. Thank you. I I love that feature that it gives me a little sound effect when someone presses the follow button. Um, I'm glad that I built that in. So yeah, thanks for the follow. I hope you're enjoying the lecture. Um, so looking at the annotation matrix, uh, we see that it has the different probes on there, um, where they are located on the genome, uh, what the, which gene they are targeting, and then with the gene, a little bit of description, and then the location of the gene that, that is being target, uh, targeted. Um, so that, that's the kind of the dimensions, right? So the, the arrays themselves, um, so had this this file here, it has like columns and rows. So the rows couple to the annotation matrix and the columns, they couple to the arrays. And then when I want to make a box plot of this file, of course, and since the first column is called sequence and is not plottable, right? You can't make a, a, a box plot of, of characters. Um, so when you make a box plot and you just say, um, box plot of the whole thing, right? So I, I would take my array data and I would just say box plot array data. Um, then I would probably get an error or it will make a box plot, but hey, you see that it will give me an error. So kind of to prevent that, um, let's go back to Notepad++. So kind of to prevent that, I'm saying, well, when I look at the files, I see that the individual or the columns of the, uh, of the array data file are made by the company ID because the company gave us back the IDs. Um, so I can select from the arrays the company ID and then use this to index the array data. And this will, of course, only select the real samples that we sent um, and it won't select the sequence column. Um, and so when I then try to create a box plot and I do LASS2 to kind of um, flip the axis, um, and then, of course, I'm able to make a nice box plot um, or 
a nice box plot. It's a box plot that kind of shows me what's going on. So it takes a while to make, and what you see is that, that there are, the numbers range from around zero, right? So the lowest intensity is in, in the order of zero, and you see here that the highest intensity varies a lot for the different arrays. Um, and there you can see that these are all very, very big numbers. Um, hey, you don't really see a box for a box plot, you just see that there's a massive amount of outliers which are on top. Um, and this, of course, has to do with the fact that when you get intensity data scanned by a laser, then this intensity data, of course, is um, not a normal distribution. Yeah, a normal distribution would show up as a normal box, um, but since the boxes are more or less all the way squeezed to the bottom, um, you know that most of the genes are off, right, because there's no intensity, and the genes that are on, they look like outliers, um, because they're, they're very, very intense compared to the average of the genes that are off. All right, so then the first question, or I think the second question is, is um, oh, the first question was, use the dim function to view the different dimensions. How many probes are there in the array data file? So if we look at the array data file, right? So we just saw that the probes are on the rows. So we see that there are 5,500, 55,821 probes on the array. Um, there are 17 columns. One of them is sequence, so there are 16 samples in our data file. Um, take a closer look at the header of the array data file. Is there any structure to the column names? Um, so um, let, let's see. Um, so we just look at the head. So is there any structure to the names? Well, there kind of is because the names are made based on the, the tissue, so HT, and then the animal ID. So that's kind of the structure, and of course there's a sequence, um, but the sequence um, uh, doesn't, and the sequence is of course just the sequence of the probe. All right, question number two, use the plot function to plot the HT2010 column of the uh, array data file. So um, I just skipped that in the answers, but we can just um, select, of course, this column, and then we can use the plot function to just plot that. Um, so this will take a while as well, and then we see here the image, right? So here we see the here we see the 55,000 probes, and for each of the probes we see the uh, the intensity. And so you see that most of the genes are actually not expressed, or most of the probes are more or less not giving you an intensity signal, and you see that the genes which are expressed are all the way at the top. Um, but of course, hey, when you would make a histogram of this, um, yeah, so instead of using plot, you can use hist for a histogram, hey, you would see that this is definitely not a normal distribution. It's, it's more of a kind of Poisson distribution, um, but it's not really a Poisson because they're not real numbers. Um, all right, print parts of the other files to your R session and figure out what the different columns and rows are. So we already did that. Um, select only the columns containing data from the array data file. In other words, do not plot the probe sequences. Use the buck plot function to visualize. So that's the one that we did before, right? So here we take from the arrays. So this is the description of the arrays. We take the company ID column and then we use this ordering and select the individuals from array data and then make a box plot um, using this LASS2. Um, and I use the LASS2 just so that the, the names of the, uh, of the different samples are like this, right? So that they are vertical and not horizontal. All right, then the next question is use the log2 function in R to transform the microarray data, save the resulting matrix into a new variable called log2 array data. All right, so let me switch back to Notepad++. So the way that I did this is to um, just say, oh, I didn't save it in a new variable. I just overwrote the old data, which of course is also possible, but you have to reload. Um, so I generally don't like these kinds of structures, right? So what I do is I take the, the, the same as what I did the box plot on before. I do the log2 transformation, and then I put it back into the original data frame. But of course, this is a destructive operation. Um, so that means that once you do this, you cannot go back. Um, and that's, of course, not the best way to do this. Um, so a better way to do this would be to follow the assignments and say, well, I'm just going to store this in something called log2 array data, and then I'm just going to plot the log2 array data. 
um, and now it's not destructive. Now I just make a new variable. W one of the drawbacks, of course, is, is that I'm now just copying the whole matrix with 55,000 probes and, and 16 samples. Um, but that, depending on if your computer has a lot of uh, RAM memory, and this is not an issue. Um, but it could be that if you're very low on RAM memory, um, that it's better to do the destructive operation and just copy paste it back in um, to where it came from. Because of course this doesn't duplicate the data because you just overwrite it. Um, so I'm just going to keep the answer that I had. So I'm just going to do the destructive operation. Normally I wouldn't do that, but for this case, like it doesn't matter too much. And so we take the log two and then we store it back and then we make a box plot again. So let's go to R and show you guys how that looks. And now, of course, we see a very common structure. Um, and so now we see that the uh, minimum intensity is slightly above zero. Um, that's just the way that that it works. Um, and there's no real zero here because it, we're looking at intensity. So if you shoot a laser at something, you will always get some intensity. Um, it's, it's never exactly zero. That is a really, really nice emoticon, uh, Testosaurus. I, I like the emotes that Twitch has. All right, but then what we see here is that um, the first four samples have a slightly higher mean compared to the next four samples. And then we see another four samples which have a slightly higher mean. And then and so it seems to be that the average expression of the array um, is kind of coupled to the, to the tissue that we're looking at. Um, so that directly brings me to another point when we start doing the normalization procedure. It might be that in, in the brain, in the hypothalamus, there are more genes active than there are in gonadal fat, right? Because if there are more genes active, then you would expect the, the, the average expression to be a little bit... Uh, <laughs> the average expression to be a little bit uh, higher. And so, and, but you see that some arrays have outliers and you also see that, that every array is slightly different from the other ones. So have to get rid of this and because this might be due to the fact that there's some real biology going on, um, but it might also be uh, due to the fact that there is some uh, uh, that, that there is some technical variation, right? It might be that the hypothalamus samples just had slightly higher concentrations um, because extracting DNA from hypothalamus might be more efficient than extracting uh, DNA from gonadal fat or uh, doing DNA to RNA. So hey, it might have a biological origin, um, but this variance might also be technical. Um, so of course we want to apply a normalization to get rid of these kind of technical variation that we see or the, or the, the large amount of variation. All right, so um, create a box plot of the unnormalized data. We did that um, and save the results. Yeah, so create a box plot of the unnormalized but log to transformation transform data. So what do we observe? We, we observe that there seems to be kind of a slight kind of correlation between the fact that hypothalamus is slightly higher expressed or as a slightly higher average expression, meaning that there might be some more genes which are active in hypothalamus than there are in gonadal fat. Um, but of course we can't really do anything with, with this observation um, because we have to normalize our data first. Um, so for the normalization we are using the preprocess core library, so let me load the library. So just that I have it ready and then the next question is um, uh, load the library, uh, normalize the data using the normalized quantile function, save the resulting matrix in a new variable, select an appropriate name. So let me see what I answered there. So let's show the notepad++ window. So here I do the normalized quantiles, right? So I, I do have a little header telling me what I'm doing and I'm actually just not adhering to what I said again because I'm using a destructive transformation again. Right, so I'm again copying it back into the to the original matrix. Um, and so you could save it in a new variable, which is advisable. But for some reason, when I wrote the answers, um, I didn't care too much about destroying the original data or being able to go back one step in the analysis. All right, so let's use this function and do the plot again. And then we see this, right? So after we've done, done the normalized quantiles, we see that every array has the same minimum value, it has the same maximum value, and all of the means are the same, but also the standard deviations surrounding these means have all been harmonized to be exactly identical to each other. 
Can you explain the difference between normalization and Windsorizing? So Windsorizing is um, looking at your data values and then fixing little errors like comma errors, right? So for example, if I'm measuring a mouse um, and I'm measuring a mouse to be 10.1 centimeters, um, then sometimes it ends up being written as 101 or 1.01. .01 in the data, right? Because a lot of times when you're in a lab and you're measuring things, then you're just writing them down on paper. Um, and that, of course, creates like a 5% error rate because every time that you write something down, you can make a little error. So when you're looking at your data, right, and you see that one of your values is a mouse, which is 10 times bigger than the average or 10 times smaller than the average, um, you always have to start wondering, is there a comma error? Right, so a comma error means that you're then Windsorizing this one value into the range in which you expect it to be. Right, you don't expect one of the mice um, to be a hundred centimeters. Right, that would have you would have noticed that during the experiment. Um, so, so Windsorizing is more or less a looking at your data by eye and blotting out values that you either don't like or putting values in the normal range. So normally Windsorizing. Um, which was invented by the Earl of Windsor, um, is something that you do to kind of um, get rid of mistakes in your data. Well, normalization is something that, that is done not to get rid of mistakes, it is done to um, harmonize data, right? So in this case, we are normalizing. And like I told you guys last time, there's two different ways of normalizing. One is normalizing internally, and the other one is normalizing between. And so since the idea here is to compare these arrays to each other. Um, if one of the arrays would be from 0 to 10 and the other array would be from 10 to 20 at the intensity values, then of course every gene on between these two arrays would come up as being different. And of course that's not true because like if we look at a gonadal fat sample and we compare that to another gonadal fat sample, then we don't expect all of the genes in the genome to be different, mm -hmm. right? So, so normalization generally is, is a technique that allows you to get rid of unwanted variation, um, which sometimes means that you get rid of some real biological effects as well. Well, Windsorizing is looking at your data and, and really removing things which are obvious errors. Um, one of the things which also falls under Windsorizing, which I would not advise people to do, um, but I've seen people do it, is that when you have your data measured, right, and you have a missing data point, to put in the average on this missing data point. And I would never do that, because statistically speaking, it does not really make sense to replace a missing value uh, by a value which is, um, which is the average. Um, and it can actually hurt you in the long run. Um, but Windsorizing is not really a normalization technique. It's just a technique to get rid of them. Um, but when we now look at our data, we see that, that everything has the same mean. But of course, before we said the observation is, is that the hypothalamus might have more genes which are active than compared to the gonadal fat. So we, we by doing this normalization step, right, we might have removed some really, really important um, genetic variants or some some real biological phenomenon. And this is, of course, one of the one of the issues with normalization. Since normalization is kind of a blunt tool, um, you can normalize away things which might be really interesting. Um, so you always have to be careful when you do normalization um, and you have to have a good reason to normalize. But test, since we are wanting to compare arrays with each other, we can't have the fact that one array has a completely different scale than the other ones. Um, so again, create the box plot of the now locked and four. Does it look normalized like in the lecture? Um, yeah, this looks pretty normalized. All right, question 10. Uh, when looking at the other files, we observe that this data is coming from multiple individuals and has multiple tissues measured. Uh, first, we want to know something more about the relationship between the different arrays. So the first step, what I generally do when I get back microarray data is to look at the correlation between the different samples, right? Um, so the question number 10 is, use the correlation function and create a correlation matrix, save the matrix in a new variable. And then question number 11 um, is use the 
heat map function to plot the correlation matrix as a heat map, what do you see in the heat map? All right, so let's go back um, to the script. Um, so I'm doing this in one go uh, because I don't want to kind of um, store it and define a lot of variables. So I'm using the correlation function. So I'm correlating, um, again, the columns which have data. And here you see that I use the Spearman method. So I think that most people know that correlation comes in several forms. So you have Pearson correlation and you have Spearman correlation. Pearson correlation you can use when things are normally distributed. Um, if you have a distribution which is not a normal distribution, you would want to use Spearman correlation um, because it, it uses a rank method. So it's not sensitive to outliers. Um, and why did I choose Spearman? Well, that has to do a little bit with how the box plot uh, looks, right? So if we go back and then we see that it is not a normal distribution, right? The, 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 the distribution on the, on the bottom of the arrays is different from the distribution on the top of the arrays. So you see that there's more, or there's the, the, a normal, um, I can show you this in a different way as well. Um, so let's just make a histogram of one of the arrays, right? Um, so just take the first one and make a histogram of it. Um, and then you see this, right? And this is definitely not a normal distribution. So you don't want to use Pearson correlation to compare these things. You, you definitely want to use Spearman correlation. And you can see here very clearly that some of the values are between zero and one, which is a little bit awkward because that, that's just the way, it's a log to transform data set. But you see that most of the genes, like yeah, more than 15,000 genes on the first array, they are not on, they are not working at all. So they, they are off. And then you see that there's a, a kind of an expression to the, to the upside. So there's not a normal distribution. Because there's not a normal distribution, I have to use Spearman correlation instead of uh, Pearson correlation. In this case, it wouldn't matter too much, I think. I think the, the answer would be very, very similar. Um, but be aware that correlation comes into two or three different flavors, depending on, uh, on, what, you, uh, on, on, on what distribution you are looking at. All right, so let's do the heat map of the correlation matrix. This might take a little while, um, but let's just do it. So we see this picture, right? So and from this picture, we learn a whole bunch of things because we can now say how our data quality was and, and if everything went well. Um, so the first thing that we observe in the clustering, yeah, so if we look at the two, uh, the, the dendrogram on the top or on the other side, and yeah, what we see is this, that on average, um, hypothalamus samples are a lot more similar to hypothalamus samples than they are to gonadal fat samples, right? So we learn here that we didn't switch one of the cups. We didn't, on accident, we didn't put a hypothalamus sample into a gonadal fat sample, and we didn't, or, and we didn't swap a gonadal fat sample with a hypothalamus sample, right? So we can directly see that, um, and we see that there is that that it's very clear um, that that the, the samples are assigned okay, right? They could all be wrong, right? All of the gonadal fats could actually be hypothalamus, um, but at least internally, there's an internal consistency here. Why didn't you use Kendall correlation instead of Spearman for the non-normal distribution? Um, well, Spearman is for, is a rank-based method, so it's non-parametric. Um, Pearson is also non -par uh, Pearson is a parametric method, so you can only use it for, um, and Kendall Tau. Um, it's also a non-parametric one, and it's slightly different, but I think Kendall is preferred when you have lots of missing data, right? I think that's the difference between, um, yeah, so Pearson is parametric, um, Spearman is non-parametric, optimized for when everything is there, and then you have Kendall Tau correlation, and that is optimized when you have large amounts of missing data. Um, but you could use Kendall as well. R provides three different ways of correlation, um, but since there is no missing data, because hey, you shoot every little dot with a laser, so every little dot gets an intensity. Yeah, I thought Kendall is better when you focus on rank-based method. Um, I would say that probably Herr Dr. Spearman would disagree with that statement, and your statement would be preferred by Kendall. And that's, of course, a, it's, a, it's a flavor, right? Like, there's many different, you also have, like, bivariate correlation methods, you have, um, so there's like hundreds of different correlation methods and um, all of them have their own advantages and drawbacks. Um, so 
like someone like me would prefer a easy method and um, the easy method or the thing that what what I like a lot is that um, Spearman correlation is Pearson's correlation on ranked data um, so they are kind of interchangeable in a way um, but it's it's up to you which correlation you prefer um, and it also depends on your distribution but normally um, my kind of way of looking at it is if I have a normal distribution I use Pearson if I have a non-normal uh, then I tend to always use Spearman um, but you could use Kendall as well and and they, they probably are more or less the same right we can we can actually just check that um, so let's show the correlation matrix like this uh, that's too big so let's look at the first five versus the first five right so this is using Spearman then we can use Pearson um, and then we can use Kendall I think I can just type Ken and here you see the, the, the drawback of Kendall correlation right it takes a long time to do this it is a very heavy method it might be more accurate but like the computational time doesn't really weigh up to the, um, the we're still waiting so which is not bad right if you're a bioinformatician you're quite used to waiting um, but but this takes too long like it, it this is not a very valid method to use let's get a call I already have a coffee so we can we can wait a little bit but in this case if you would do all three methods would give you more or less the exact same uh, same answer I'm thinking that this is just going to crash R. It is actually already in a non-responding state. So, oh, you can't see that. The, you can't see the header of the thing. But all right, so it's just freezing, freezing, freezing. Yeah, cancel it. That's easier said than done um, because it it totally crashed. All right, so let's not do that. Let's use the task manager to get rid of the thing and then open up a new R window, which is just like pain in the ass and I have to resize everything which I already did at the beginning but I have to redo now so let's resize it like this and then resize it and then resize it a little bit more and there's still like a couple of pixels and like yeah there we are all right so let's reload all of our data and make our heat map again so Kendall correlation seems to be preferable when you have non-parametric data and your data set is small <laughs> I think that would be my uh, my uh, my my observation here yeah, but the heat map shows us that indeed have conatal fat is similar to conatal fat hypothalamus similar to hypothalamus um, and so we learned that we didn't mix up any samples one of the nice things that I that I that I think you can see here in this this is that there does seem to be three groups right because we know from the data that we had like the BFMIs we had the B6s and then we had the mix between the two um, and we can see here that these here are and these three samples here which cluster together they are probably the BFMI they could be the B6 as well and then you see here another three samples um, why am I missing a sample here one two three four five six seven eight huh that's interesting yeah, but there, there seems to be some grouping as well which we would expect right because there's there's three different types of animals in our data um, so we we would expect to kind of see these groups back as well but these groups are not as clear so we can't really discuss about that and we might be able to see it when we would look at a single tissue um, and instead of here plotting the name of the sample plotting the species of the sample um, and so then we might find out that these three are indeed related to each other um, but we, we this is the pattern that we would have expected from a data set which looks like this all right, so the next one is for each probe on the array calculate the overall mean on the log to normalize data using a for loop all right, so I think that this was one of the harder ones. Um, although the answer is more or less given. I don't know why I gave you the answer here. Um, that's an interesting one. Ah, I already know what's wrong. Yeah, I'm showing you guys the answers for the bioinformatics uh, for the for the R lecture. Um, so the R lecture is slightly different questions. Um, that's not 
um, that's not what I want. But anyway, let's let's just do question number twelve, right? So I'm just gonna say Q12, and I'm just gonna pop, copy paste the code. So what is happening here? So I'm going to want to calculate the overall means for each of the probes, right? Um, so I'm doing overall means is null, um, or I could do something like this. Um, so is an empty vector. And I did not do any computation yet and then I'm going to go through the rows of this normalized data um, which I didn't store so I'm just gonna have to store it here so I'm just gonna take out this part because I overwrote it right so I'm just gonna declare this variable so I'm going to go through each of the rows so through each of the probes I'm going to calculate the mean and then I'm going to add this mean to the list of means that I created so and this will go through and it will calculate all the means. Um, so let's go to R and then run the. Ah, right. I didn't. I didn't really find that. So I didn't define the variable yet. So I'm just going to do that here and then I'm just going to calculate the overall mean. So this will take a little while, right? Because it has to do this 55,000 times. Um, but then in the end, we will get an overall means. And of course, if you're doing this on a laptop, it will take some time. But like I said, that's bioinformatics for you. All right, so we get 50 warnings. So we definitely want to check the warnings. Um, so um, it tells me that for some of the computations of the mean that it did, um, it encountered non-numeric or logical values. So it returned an NA. Um, so we can we, we have to figure out where that happens, right? So if we look at the overall means, then we see that it actually happens everywhere. Um, so what went wrong? So the question is what went wrong? So first let's look at the input data set that we're using. Um, and then we see that here we should be able to calculate a mean of the first row. So we do a mean. And then it gives me an A. So for some reason, when it loaded in the data set, it did one of these R things, right? And R is really good at screwing up your data, especially when it comes to things like factorials and numerics. Um, so if we would ask for the class of this, um, then it would say data frame, that's logical. So the first number here is actually a numerical value. Um, so the reason why it doesn't do if I would unlist it then I would just get the numbers and now if I would ask the class it's still a numeric value so it's a little bit weird that I cannot calculate the mean directly because I'm, I'm expecting that it would um, and if I do an unlist on it just to make sure that it's not a data f then it works that's kind of interesting. So um, the mean function here doesn't really work because it, it internally stores probably the numbers not as uh, numbers, but it stores them probably as um, factorials. So to prevent that, I'm just going to uh, change the code a little bit from the code that we had. And I'm just going to say, well, I know that when I unlist them, then it, then it, it, it definitely it takes them out of this little sub matrix that you have with just as one row um, and then we just have values so let's try this again so let's go to R and now use the unlisted version um, to see if we can calculate the means and that should be actually a lot quicker because computing and getting this warning is actually slowing it down quite a lot so it should be relatively quick in calculating all of the different means of each of the probes All right, so no warning, so everything should have been going correctly. So here we see the overall mean, so we just look at them like this. And now, of course, when we plot these, um, we can see again for each of the probes, hey, we can now see the mean expression of the probe. And this already looks different when compared to when we looked at an individual array, right? So it seems that, that genes, yeah, because now it seems that more genes are active. And this is of course because the genes which are active in the brain generally tend to be not active in the fat and the genes which are active in the fat tend to be not active in the brain, right? So we see that on average, there's much more probes that should have been expressed. Um, if we make a histogram of the overall means, yeah, we should now also see that this is the case. Yeah, there's still a lot of genes like 14,000 which are not active, but we see that this, this, this hump here is much bigger. So there are more genes which are active if I just look at 
each of the probes and see if they're active in one of the two tissues. All right, then the next question is choose two groups which you think might be interesting. For example, the F1 gonadal fat and the BF myconatal fat. We can select from the array annotation the company ID or the atlas ID of the arrays in this group. We can use this to extract the correct columns of the data. Um, so it had this little example. So let's just copy paste the example into Notepad++. Um, so we go here. Um, oh, I already had this, so I did have that one. All right, so here what we do is we uh, we say which of the array strain is F1 and which of the tissues is gonadal fat, and then of course I can extract these from from the arrays, right? Because now I'm getting the indexes in the arrays, and then what I'm doing is this: then I'm taking these rows and I'm only taking the company ID, right? So F1 gonadal fat samples. So I'm saying take from the strain column only the end uh, the things where it is F1 and in the tissue column it has to be GF. Same thing here from the strain column take BFMI from the tissue column take gonadal fat and then take only the company IDs of these individuals. All right so let's see so let's go to R let's um, show you guys the R window right so we have array Array F1, and then we have a GF. Right, so these are the two samples which, so there's two F1 samples for gonadal fat, and then if we look at the Berlin fat mouse, BFMI gonadal fat, then we see that there's actually four gonadal fat samples of the Berlin fat mouse. All right, then um, yeah, we can now use the um, array F1 to extract the correct columns from the array data, do this for both groups. So yeah, of course, when I look at the array data, array data, and then I can select the first 10 rows and I can select, for example, the array F1 gonadal fat sample, and then it will just give me these two. And of course, I can do the same thing when I look at the BFMI. Right, so in this case I get four columns. All right, then the next question was a more complicated question because now I wanted you guys to compute different things in one go, right? In the first for loop we only computed the mean and remember that, um, but then and now the question is calculate for all of these probes the mean of the two groups, the group that you selected, for example the BFMI gonadal fat and the F1 gonadal fat, the log to ratio between these means and the p-value using a t-test. And the t-test is going to go wrong here because um, t-test you have to have I think at least three samples. Um, and, and I think that that will go horribly wrong. Um, but had the um, uh, let me show you guys. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create variables which will hold my answers, right? So I'm going to create a mean F1 gonadal fat, right? So this will, ho this will hold the means for the F1 individuals gonadal fat. I'm going to do the same thing for the BFMI. So I'm going to say I have mean BFMI gonadal fat. I have my log to ratios. Initially, I haven't computed anything yet, so they are null. And then I have my p-values, which initially are also null. Right? Then I'm going to go through the number of rows of the array data, and then I'm just going to take this one element, take the F1 individual, take the same probe, take the BFMI individuals, calculate the mean, and then store this as mean 1 and mean 2. Then I'm going to divide mean 1 by mean 2, and take the log 2, this is then the ratio, and then I'm going to do the t-test, which probably will fail for all of them, because I have only four individuals versus two individuals, um, but hey, I'm going to do the t-test anyway, and then I'm going to calculate the p-value, and then I'm just going to add the things that I computed to the correct um, variable that is going to hold it for all of the probes. Um, and so I'm going to add the, the computed mean to the means of the F1, the computed mean to the means of the BFMI, the ratio to the log two ratios, and the p-value to the p-values. Um, and we're just going to run this. Um, I don't think that the uh, um, that the t-test will work, um, but 
if we're lucky it does if we're unlucky we get just p values which are all na um, but at least like we try to answer it so probably if we would have taken two different groups if we would have taken the b6n um, versus the bfmi then probably it would have been three versus four or something like that um, and this of course will take much longer because now every time that we we look at a row for this row we take the f1 individuals we calculate the mean we take the same row take the bfmi individuals calculate the mean calculate the log ratio then do the t-test so hey it's going to be kind of heavy and it's going to have to do more computational work than in the f first loop so again hey, we can take some coffee and we can just let this run uh, and I'm very impatient so I'm just going to quit it halfway through so I'm just going to press the stop button and we're just going to see how far we are so we were almost done so I was a little bit too impatient because I, we stopped it at 52,000 out of 55,000 um, doesn't matter too much because now the idea was to create the volcano plot by doing the minus log 10 p-values against the log 2 ratios right so we have the log 2 ratios which look like this and then we have the minus log 10 p-values but we only start p-value uh, p-values so these are all the p-values um, so now we have to do the minus log 10 of the p-values and we want to plot this so we are going to put the p-values are on the y-axis so we're just going to say y equals minus log 10 and x equals and that's the ratios um, log 2 ratios log 2 ratio so the x-axis log 2 and the y-axis is going to be the minus log 10 p-value and now we see kind of the characteristic um, volcano plot right you see kind of the, the the zero line so here there's no difference in the ratio and here we see the minus log 10 of the p-value right so which genes are interesting genes to look at those are the ones which are all the way over here yeah, because these have a big difference between the f1s and the bfmis and they are also very significantly different right this is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 this is 1 times 10 to the minus 5 right so the interesting genes are more or less in this area when we look at the upregulated genes and this these genes are more or less the interesting genes when we look at the downregulated genes all right and then there was an additional question to color the dots of the volcano plot by the distance of the origin um, did i do that no i didn't color them but you you can do that right you can you can just compute the euclidean distance from each of the points uh, towards the zero zero and then hey you can color them based on that error 404 what's not found uh, test this out what are you missing I will make you guys a really nice colored volcano plot in the additional question um, hey, but this is more or less how you would look at it came up on, on our on my laptop you got an 404 error on your laptop on R that seems strange like R generally doesn't give 404 errors is that a 404 for loading the data because that that can 404 with a file not found it, then you have to download the proper files and set them in the correct working directory you do have to extract a zip file though um, I had some people in the past trying to directly load the um, zip file into R that, that does work um, because R it has this uh, zip I think or gzip um, so you have a zip file extract but you can use this zip function to directly load from zip files if you wanted to um, but I would advise you to just extract the zip file and then go um, and set your working directory to where you extracted it um, but this is more or less how you look at microarray data right so and it's it's just a very very basic introduction uh, let me look the recording is now going on for 54 minutes and um, we only discussed the um, answers which is perfectly fine so let's go back to the PowerPoint so for everyone watching on Moodle you are going to miss one of the amazing breaks um, so the break is going to be pandas I think I think the first one is pandas all right so I will stop the recording